everybody, Patrick Connor here, and welcome to the Knuckles and Gloves podcast. A little bit less boxing history today because we have a big fight coming up this weekend, man. We're talking about Saul Canelo Alvarez versus Gennady Triple G Golovkin, the third fight. I'm here with my boy, Eris Pina, CompuBox operator, and also just my buddy, Fight History File, whatnot. What's up, man? How are you? Good, man. It's going to be a big fight this weekend. Should be a good fight this weekend. Looking forward to it. I think it's going to be a good fight. I hope it's a good fight. I mean, um, I, I kind of feel as though, in general, they match up well stylistically. The first two fights at least seem to, you know, bear that out. They, uh, Canelo's style, Golovkin's style, their intensity, both of them, and just the way that they fight seems to just kind of make for good action or at least intriguing action, I feel. Absolutely, man. Their styles have blend very well together in their first two fights. Um... Canelo is like the um, Canelo, Golovkin, excuse me, is like a pressure boxer. He comes really forward. Doesn't much, you know, he can box, but he doesn't much to take a back step. Canelo, the same thing. Canelo is more of a flat footed guy now, especially over the years. And he's willing to stand in the pocket with Triple G. You know what I mean? Both guys take their time and try to place their spots. But when they get into it and as the rounds progress, that's when things get really, really explosive. And, um, with 24 rounds under their belt and as much animosity as there is as there is between each other as between them now uh you would just have to think man this third fight is definitely gonna it's definitely gonna be explosive in my opinion <clears throat> i think excuse me i mean the the first two fights happened at middleweight and that was kind of the it, it played into the storyline in the first fight man i it's actually crazy I guess I was just going back on their records just to double check and make sure, you know, I have all the dates down and all that type of shit. The first fight was almost five full years ago, dude. Holy shit. And even, even then we were talking about like, uh, Canelo's waiting until Golovkin's old as fuck. And then they, for the rematch, he's like, Canelo was waiting a fucking year. What the fuck? You know, and we all know there was, uh, there was all their circumstances, but still it was like, God damn it, a year, and now here we are, four years on. It always takes a while, though, sometimes, man, for whatever crazy. reason, for a trilogy to, for a trilogy to finish up. Unless they go back to back to back, like Gotti Ward. But, you know, usually for, like, a big fight, think about, like, for instance, Leonard Duran, for instance. You know? That's true. No, that's true. And, uh, I mean, there are other there are other trilogies that happen, like, uh, back to back to back. Zale Graciano, totally. you know, but that's that doesn't happen that often, though, either, too, because there is a whole bunch of, like, financial reasons why that wouldn't make sense. And, mm-hmm. you know, you got two fighters knocking the shit out of each other in such a short period of time. And I get it. And, of course, too, with mandatories involved and other stuff going on and everybody else trying to get their place in line and say, no, 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 it's my turn now. We got to strip you. Yada, yada, yada. A lot of shenanigans. It's boxing. (laughs) Yeah, a lot of shenanigans, dude. And I mean, that's uh, according to kind of social media, boxing fans and whatnot, even going up into the first fight between Canelo Alvarez and Gennady Golovkin, many people felt as though that fight was coming two, three years, maybe even four years later than it should have. I mean, Many people felt as though Canelo was kind of delaying the inevitable as far as moving fully up to middleweight and kind of playing this like, oh, I'm not even a big middleweight thing. And then now, of course, fully unifying at super middleweight and then eventually even moving up to light heavyweight. And so it kind of makes that argument a little weird uh, in retrospect. And so it makes the timing of the first Golovkin fight, I don't want to say suspect, but many people, myself included, feel as though it could have happened a little bit earlier, perhaps should have happened a little earlier. And in any case, here we are many years later now. Um, do you remember how you scored the first two fights? Yeah, totally. And I agree with you also that the fight definitely could have taken place for maybe a year or two earlier. But that was more so Canelo. I think he was being very spiteful because he even said too that he didn't want to give the Triple G, the satisfaction of getting a third fight and a payday off of him because of all the things that happened between them, all the things that Triple G said about him, and just all that, you know, just Canelo, did, uh, Canelo just trying to be like the, the, the guy saying, yeah, I'm the one in charge now. I'm the one that can give you the fight or not, and I choose not to deal with it. But here we are. Since he lost the fight to Beevil, everything else going on. Um, well, the fight was actually in place before the Beevil one, but like DAZN 
signed Triple G and Canelo with the idea that they were going to get this whole trilogy together. You know what I mean? Like they threw up massive amounts of money into this and the way it came about, man, it all, it just, it, it did take a long time. It was dragging and dragging. Finally, it's going to happen, but it seems like it was a little bit past then what everybody was really hoping when everybody was really excited about it. So it's past its marination date, but regardless, it should still be good. But back to your original question, I, um, the first fight, I thought Triple G won it. I definitely did. I'm in the consensus with that, I, I think, I assume. Um, Canelo definitely had his moments. It was a good fight. It wasn't like a complete whitewash, but I thought that Triple G definitely had command of the majority of the fight and proved himself to be a, you know, a winner in that one. I haven't watched it in a minute, but I do know that I scored it for Triple G. And the rematch was a lot closer, obviously. And um, I can't say that. I think it was an out-and-out out robbery that Canelo won, but definitely the judging was a little bit more in his favor, considering, obviously, what happened in the first fight. And, um, yeah, all that considered, there's a lot of motivation now for Triple G in this one because he thinks he's been screwed twice. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you there. I think that uh, I pretty much agree. I think that I thought at the time that Golovkin should have won the first fight I I think I've watched it maybe once since and still felt like he should have won close. Uh, it was just an issue for me of <clears throat> Canelo just fighting a bit too passively, not throwing nearly enough, um, definitely landing very well and, and countering well, but his counters didn't really seem to have much of an effect. He was fighting too much off the ropes, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so I, th I thought that he kind of lost the fight because there was also a case of Golovkin was not throwing all that much mm -hmm. himself and could have been busier and didn't help his own case by being busier. Um, and then on top of that, I thought that they both in some ways repeated their mistakes in the second fight except for Canelo was simply busier. He was more willing to engage. He was more willing to, as soon as Golovkin started punching, you know, punch with him and like punch like he was pissed off type of shit, you know, like, oh, you're going to fucking dare to punch me? Fuck that. You know, he was fighting angry at times. And I thought that that definitely helped. Uh, that definitely worked in his favor as far as getting him the decision and that he could have and probably should have deserved a, a close decision. Um but yeah, I mean, so here we are with the with the third fight, and it's the timing is so weird though, because it would seem that if they would have fought immediately, you know, the momentum, I guess, would have been going to Canelo anyway, since he picked up that decision. But now, one of the biggest issues I see going into this fight, um, as far as a very uphill climb for Golovkin, despite the fact that I like their styles mixing up. Golovkin just has not been nearly as active. He made like you well, like you were talking about with Canelo not fighting him kind of out of spite. That first mistake that he made, and and I'm not saying I would have made the same mistake. I would have done the same shit he did, and I get it. But I think that he made the mistake of believing that he could kind of uh, win the fans over by heckling Canelo a little bit, mm -hmm. and that it worked but only temporarily and not only did it work only temporarily but then it wound up flipping back on him because canelo was like mm, so now i hold the cards and fuck you yeah. so that was, a, was so much more active than him too like and, and so that was a the first big backfire and then the second big backfire for canelo and a lot of people like namely i think if i said this shit on social media like twitter and if it somehow got to like, you know, his promoters and shit like that, they'd probably get pissy and give me some stupid response. But like, you know, one of the big problems that I saw was that Golovkin was fixated on getting another Canelo fight to the mm -hmm. point where he wasn't willing to do other shit. He was waiting like, okay, am I going to get it now? And then Canelo would fight somebody else and be like, all right, I guess I'm going to have to schedule some other shit. Mm -hmm. And then three months, four months, six months later, it's going to fight me again. No, damn, Niaz, I'm going to have to go look for some other shit. And each time it was like taking him time to go figure out what he was going to do. And I'm not saying he didn't do stuff uh, worthwhile in the meantime. You know, the Derevianchenko fight, obviously a high profile fight. And Derevianchenko is a guy who's very skilled, 
a lot of people thought he lost that fight. But um, and on top of that, he just has not been particularly active. And then going directly into this fight, he had a hell of a time against Murata, a yes. guy that uh, that many felt he should not have a hell of a time against. And on top of that, you know, that was almost six months ago. And so six months on, he already looked a little old then. Mm -hmm. it's That could be a big, big problem for him. Absolutely, man. And the fact is, how old is he now? He's 40, correct? Yeah, 40, 41, something like that. 40, yeah. yeah. So he's 40 years old. And some of these fights that he's had and after <coughs> the second Canelo fight have been very brutal. The uh, Darianchenko fight in particular was really rough. I mean, he came out very marked up. He was visibly hurt in that fight to the body. And like you said, a lot of people thought that he might have lost that fight. It was it was close. It was legitimately a very close fight. But not only was it close, it was brutal and taxing on a guy that's had a long career and a very long amateur career. And a person that used to be very active before that as well. You know what I mean? Like, I know can, um, Golovkin has slowed down. And he's one guy that I'm not even going to complain if his schedule has, like, calmed down a little bit over the years. Because if anyone deserves kind of a break, he does. You know what I mean? He's been fighting top, top competition for over a decade. Um, and the style that he has in the way that he, you know, he, he is pretty good defensively, but he can't get hit. And he's sometimes willing to get hit to show people when he gets bored or whatever it may be. Like, it is taxing. It does wear you down. And the wear and tear has been shown noticeably so in his last few fights. Like you said, the Murata fight was really brutal. Early on, it looked like Murata was going to steamroll him after a while because he was looking every bit as 40 years old. But once he started warming up and started, you know, shaking the rust off a little bit, he, you know, he looked devastating. The way he knocked uh, Murata's mouthpiece out and I think subsequently might have broken his jaw, whatever it was. Like, he really, you know, he had flashes of his old self in there and he looked good. And I know that gave him some motivation and he's feeling, and he's feeling well heading into this, uh, to this third fight. Whereas Canelo just lost to Bivol. Didn't look particularly great in that fight. And... To be honest, you can almost, I would almost say, in my opinion, even though he's been winning and been dominating a lot of opponents, he's almost been fighting in cruise control in the last few fights. You know, he's still like he's just getting bigger. He's always been a little sporadic in his attack. You can tell, like, in the way he does, he still tries to do like his trick shots. He's practicing stuff and he almost goes in there with the assumption because you need that confidence. But I mean, like, just knowing that he's going to beat this guy and it's just, you know what I mean? So, now that he gets beat in, a, in this fight with, uh, with Bevel, didn't look particularly great. Still kind of thought to himself that he deserved the decision because of his name almost. Um, we're at a point now with this fight where <clears throat> Golovkin has the momentum almost because he's coming off a win, becoming champion again, feeling good. Uh, there's a relatively quick turnaround, at least for him, in terms of his next fight. Plus, He's fighting his rival that he's been chasing for a number of years now. Like you said, it's been such a gap since their last fight. So all things ahead, man, you can't beat this. That's actually a really good point. Yeah, that's a really good point that uh, the two things about the Murata fight was that I'm not sure if a lot of people remember. <laughs> I remember pretty specifically, actually, before Golovkin and his team were supposed to go to Japan, they were off at some beach like taking photos and it was like Hawaii or some shit. And they're like, we're over here and blah, blah, blah. We're not even blah, 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 you know, doing some shit. And I was like, aren't they supposed to be like going to Japan like a week from today? Like, in, like, isn't the fight for like, you know, 10 days from now or some shit. And I just remember thinking that's, they're cutting it close with COVID and all this shit. And then the next thing I knew, like two days later, Japan was like, hey, if you're not already here, you're fucked. <laughs> and so sure enough, like, you know, Golovkin's team, they didn't say nothing. And then like the next day they were like, oh, we don't know what happened. And I remember just thinking like, oh, you guys screwed the pooch, bro. You guys fucked up. You guys waited too long. And so and then on top of that, you know, so that fight gets postponed. And on top of that, yeah, dude, I could kind of get it. You know, Golovkin might have a difficult time getting up for Murata, as they say. Uh, that's some shit Roy Jones used to say, like fighters get up for Roy Jones. Roy Jones doesn't get up for other fighters. So of course they're going to have a good night. You know, that type of shit, even though it's kind of bullshit, the thought behind it, I get it. Um, whereas like you had just said, Golovkin Canelo's like the dude he's been aiming for. He's been living for this fucking moment for a couple of years now. So I could easily envision a scenario where he's just in better shape. And on top of that, uh, like I said, middleweight, 
Now this is taking place at super middleweight and those extra eight pounds might be just a total fucking feast for Golovkin, bro. Like, I mean, you know, he said that he could make 154 a while back. I, I don't know if he actually could. I know that he was sometimes clear in middleweight by like a pound or two, but still, you know, junior middleweight, that's a different story. But when you're not having to cut that last minute, you know, five, eight, 10 pounds, I'm sure that's just got to be a totally different story. He might feel great. Absolutely. Or he could just show his age that night, man. We're just, you also know, true. There's, there's variables. You don't know. Because the thing is, as much as I'm just saying, you know, that as much uh, motivation Golovkin has coming into this fight, same thing has to be said for Canelo. He's coming off a loss. Canelo is not used to losing. He was used to being the pound for pound best on the planet. Um, all the other fighters who are on the pound for pound list are aspiring to be on it who are usually have a lot of, you know, don't usually have a lot of compliments to say for their fellow competitors. You know how this era is. Everyone wants to talk shit on Twitter. Um, everybody loves Canelo. You know what I mean? You see Spence, you see this one, you see that one. Everybody always has high praise for him, how he is style, his work ethic, blah, blah, blah. Correct, right? So for him to lose, and even though it was a definitive loss, everybody agrees that he lost. In his mind, he still doesn't, he still can't comprehend that he lost because this is him. You know what I mean? And coming into that now, <clears throat> he's coming into this fight now for a third fight with his rival off of a loss. And now he feels like he has something to prove because everybody's starting to question him too. Because he didn't, he didn't look great in that fight. Like, I mean, it wasn't like the Bevo fight was a complete blowout, but it was, you yeah, know, he just never where, really like got going. You know, no, like, he, he just didn't. Now, he never got in the groove. Bevel, you know, a lot of that was because of Bevo. But, like, yeah, he just – the same thing. Canelo's always just kind of been in the same gear in his last few fights, even though he doesn't really have to move into another one because of it. It's the same thing. He just stalks, 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 waits, you know, and then he starts countering. Like, he lands perfect shots and, like, places them, stuff like that, but he's not overly active. And then he'll just wait and then explode with, like, one of his, you know, signature uppercuts and then – start laying, landing yeah, from there. The, you said trick shots and that's like that's like the perfect description yeah when he because, goes like that and then throws like the upper yeah person. you'll you'll you see in like there's these elaborate setups that he does and you can see him do it in training too where like he'll use his head movement or he'll do some shit where he does like a like three big steps and then it's like you know like at a fucking big hook and then an uppercut type of sh you know it's some weird just unorthodox a combination that you don't normally see and so they and they look flashy as hell and on top of that because of his speed and his work work ethic because he's just drilling this shit every day all day and that's what sets great fighters apart you know and so they look great but at the same time that's the kind of shit where if you don't have more consistency and fundamentals to fall back on and that doesn't work like against bivol you could be in a hole dude it could be you could be in trouble and he was. He was in Bivol is obviously bigger than him, taller, lankier, knew how to use that space and distance and is a master boxer. He right. didn't fall for Canelo's traps either. Yeah. Because you know, like, like when Canelo likes to lay on the ropes and tries to wave you in so he can try countering you and all that, Bivol didn't really fall for that. And also, too, to his credit, he was able to hold his arm up because he took a fucking pounding on that. And that's another thing that Golovkin, who we said is slowing down a little bit, his body's breaking down. Is he going to be able to handle when Canelo starts beating him up when, you know, working him on the arms, hitting him on the forearm and the, everything like that? Because he's going to do that, you know, and and he's, um <clears throat> excuse me, over the years now, we've also noticed that Golovkin has been a little bit susceptible to, uh, susceptible to the body. You know, he was definitely noticeably hurt in the Derbyanchenko fight. Yep. He was noticeably hurt, I believe, in the Murata fight. Yep. And um, Canelo definitely, I'm sure, has noticed that. And we'll take advantage of that. And Canelo is a noted body puncher himself. And that left hook to the body, right hand to the body. You know, he's no joke when he goes there. Sporadic, but no joke. And, you know, it's going to be interesting. I mean, like, is, is Golovkin going to be able to take that? Is his body going to break down because of the wear and tear? Uh, there's a lot of questions. I don't know if this fight's going to go to distance, man. I have a feeling it might not. To be honest. I, I I haven't looked at any of the odds, but I wouldn't be surprised if the odds were, you know, if there were good odds that the fight does not go the distance, uh, yeah. even though the first two did, just based on a, the host of other factors and the time that's passed. I wouldn't be that surprised. 
And uh, yeah, dude, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff going on enough that it's really intriguing. And I think that another element here too. I mean, we can just keep going back and forth and devil devil's advocate advocating this shit all day. But um, you know, if if Canelo gets overconfident and thinks like, man, this guy's old, I'm gonna fuck him up. Golovkin at the end of the day still has that punching power. He can See, still man. knock your fucking block off, dude. You know, I've been ringside for. Uh... I talked about this on the show before, but for newer listeners, I've been ringside for two um, Golovkin fights. First one was against Curtis Stevens at the theater at MSG. And, yeah, you know, it's one thing Great to knockdown. see that photo. It's one thing to see that photo of Stevens when he got dropped. It's another thing to actually witness that live, man. And to see his face, because the, the, first of all, to hear that punch, all right? Like to hear the dunk, because li- listening to Golovkin live and up close is like something unreal, man. You just hear this like, it sounds like tree trunks, you know, it's just doosh, doosh, doosh. like it's, you know, some of the, the, the type of power we talked about on um, our biggest puncher show um, with some power punchers, they just have like a certain sound that they make when they hit you. It sounds like, you know, when you're hitting a heavy bag, it's an unreal sound that you just know it's just unreal power that's being hit into you and takes your ass out. And Golovkin possesses that. And plus the technique that he throws with it, and the torque and the, you know the fact that he's not wild with his punches everything just has a purpose especially early on when he first came on the scene on the u.s scene is like you know man he was unreal and that's why people are wondering and um <clears throat> making comparisons to saying oh you know how he would have done in the 80s and asking oh man you know golovkin against tommy hearns golovkin against marvin Hagler, golovkin against duran um the rest of the four kings you know and other guys hopkins Julian Jackson, Gerald McClellan, the list goes on and on. It's it's fun to compare him because Golovkin kind of fits well with any of those errors when you really think about it. But, I mean, it's like, but that power was unreal, dude. So I watched <laughs> that. I was ringside for that one. And then I was ringside for the Daniel Gill fight. And that was at the big group at MSG. And the same thing, man. When Gill got dropped the first time or the second time, whatever it was, and he gets up. And when he shakes his head, it wasn't at the referee saying he didn't want to continue. He was basically shaking his head like, what the fuck? Like, he was completely just shell-shocked. You know, like one of those parts in the video game when you lose your last life and you start shaking your head. Yeah. Like you know what I mean? Yeah. That's what he yeah. was. He had no idea what just happened to him. And that was the one where Golovkin took a punch while he was landing at the same time, right? Yeah. Like, he goes and he eats it, and then he had him the same, and then Gil just, you know. Got fucking smacked around. Yeah, I mean he's uh he's a really good puncher. Uh he's more skilled than advertised. He's he's more of a boxer puncher than just a pure puncher. Um but just obviously has his hands are heavy enough that it's he's definitely leaning more toward the puncher side without question. Um yeah, man, it's it's a it's a tough tough fight and I think that it's actually going I, I don't I don't see how it winds up being a bad fight. It should be a pretty good fight. Um, what, where are you kind of leaning as far as what do you think is going to happen? Before I answer that, let me ask you this. What do you think of Golovkin's, um, performances since he, since he hooked up with Jonathan Banks? Um, that's what I think is he's been a little bit spotty because Banks is the type of guy that, I don't know. I feel like he's been trying to change his style to be more of like a patient boxer or so. And it just, it does. I just see like there's a difference between him and what Abel Sanchez, who I consider, I think is a little bit overrated for what he did with Golovkin and how people were like, you know, putting him on a pedestal as they do with any trainer who has a hot commodity and they become the flavor of the month. You know what I mean? But yeah. the style that Sanchez kind of taught, which he noticed with Terry Norris and others back in the day, which is more attack as opposed to like being, you know, patient. I'm not sure if it blends well with Golovkin. And you've said, and from my opinion too, I've been able to see that, at, you know, in his performances. I I agree. Um, like I I think that uh, with a guy like Golovkin, as many amateur fights as he had, he's already had a number of pro fights, obviously. So I don't know that he needs a whole lot of training so much as he needs a motivator, you know, somebody who is like a spiritual guide, if you will, you know, in the ring, that type of shit. Totally. totally. Um, and I think that Abel Sanchez, at least, I I don't know what the actual split was about, but I think that at least for a while, Abel Sanchez fit that role. 
the impression that I get and kind of what I was talking about earlier when I was talking about the mistakes that I thought Golovkin had made, the impression that I get is that I almost just feel like Golovkin got a little too popular too quick, too quickly and then began overestimating his pull, began overestimating his influence, his, you know, whatever you want to call that. You know what I mean? His selling power, drawing power, and then <clears throat> overplayed his hand. And on top of overplaying his hand, he's kind of now, uh, I mean, I don't want to call him a prima donna because I don't know him that well. You know, <laughs> I don't want to, you know, but he has obviously taken a bit of like a heel turn in the last few years. And to me, it seems as though he's kind of like buying his own hype. That's that's what how I read the behavior. And so if I read the behavior correctly, I'm not surprised that he would kick uh, someone to the curb who was maybe a little bit more adamant, or more forceful in the gym, who is more like, nah, we got to do it this way. And you're not being aggressive enough rather than like, how do you feel? Like, you know, you, are you feeling okay? Like you're looking pretty good in there, but I, I'd like you to slow it down. You know, like you need to use your skills more. And that's not to say that that doesn't work with Jonathan Banks and somebody else. And on top of that, I understand from the perspective of like uh, Golovkin's 40 and he needs to preserve what he's, what he's got. He can't just attack all the time, but at the same time, it, we've seen already the result is not as good. He's struggled. And so um, I don't know. I can I don't know if that's specifically banks, but I mean, there does seem to be a correlation. Totally. And you know, his body attack, which was so vicious and, uh, a favorite of everybody's early on when he's first on the scene on the U.S. scene around 2011, 2012, and it's been missing in a lot. I mean, he still throws body shots, but like you know, it's body just jab. Body. You know, he's not yeah, as consistent every, with his jab. Everything. And you, noticeably in the same in the uh, in the Canelo fights, his body attack was kind of missing too. So it's another thing I'd love to see come back to it. But to answer your question, man, you know, I just said earlier that not, I don't, I'm not sure if this fight's going to go in a distance. I'm still not sure. If it does go the distance, I think Canelo will edge it because it's really, really tough to beat him on a decision and seeing how close the fights were, judges usually kind of lean his way. And if it's going to be another close fight, I could see that happening. But um, I just don't think it's going to be as wide or as much of a beatdown as people expect it to be. You know, Triple G's coming in motivated. Canelo's coming in motivated. I think it's going to be another really close fight, but I think Canelo's going to edge it at the end of the day. I think that's a good call, dude. Yeah, because like I kind of opened up saying, uh, I think their styles just mix. Yeah, they mesh well. Um, you know that that boxer puncher style of Golovkin just seems to meld well with Canelo, who's just a more kind of measured boxer puncher. Yes. Yep. And also the animosity, you know, it's, it's pretty real together, bro. They really don't like each other. Canelo really like talks with a lot of bitterness in his voice about how much he hates triple G and um, all the shit that triple G has said about him and, you know, their fights and everything like that. And with triple G, you can hear with him how like he almost finds it more of a joke. Like he clearly doesn't like Canelo either. But, like, the way he, like, talks shit, like, he sometimes jokes more about it, like, in the quotes that he says about him. You know what I mean? And I'm sure and that irritates Canelo even more. Yeah. So it's kind of like... You well, know. you can... I, I almost feel like that there's some bitterness from Golovkin, too, in a way. Totally. Like, and, and, you know, like, I kind of get it. Like, you know, you brought up Hagler, too. Uh, it's not the same. I'm not saying that it's like, you know, Golovkin is Hagler. He's not. Um, but at the same time, you brought up the way that he had to kind of come up, which was uh, slightly more difficult, not quite as charmed as a yeah. Canelo who, you know, was looked after for much of his career and especially fairly young, getting with Golden Boy and being featured and invested into very heavily, et cetera. Um, yep. Whereas Golovkin kind of had to battle it out on the European scene and on the kind of lower level uh middleweight scene despite the fact that even at the time he held one of the you know it was like i think of the wba title but it was yes. like the regular title as opposed to this you know you know and think about this too but think about this pat like when he never had a chance to become undisputed champion either for a while when he totally deserved it when sergio martinez was champion martinez and company made sure that you know they they never fought him um by the time Martinez loses it now to Miguel Cotto. 
Cotto went out of his way to say he was never going to fight Golovkin, even to the point where I remember he said something. Uh, what's up, Marvin? Uh, Lord. Yeah. Um, even to the point where he said something to the, to the effect of, he was like, if he wants the belt, he can take it. I don't care. He can have the belt. Like, cause he didn't want to fight him, you know? And then. Yeah. That was the, beat- that was the member of the interview where he was like, I think it was Max Kellerman's like, so are you going to fight Golovkin? And he's like, eh. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like, dude, just say no. We know it's no. Because he knew he probably would have got absolutely thumped, and we get it. Cotto definitely would have got stomped in that fight. So he loses down to Canelo, and then the same thing. When Canelo becomes champion first, he gets knocked. He knocks down Amir Khan, and you know, going on from there, and people would, and um, and then finally he does the whole Triple G. You're next, my friend. But it took a while for that to happen. How long was Golovkin on the scene before he finally got that shot? You know what I mean? So yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah, dude. It it's I get it. You know, so I get the bitterness. Um, I get. I think I get it more from Golovkin than from Canelo, which I guess that kind of depends on whether or not you believe Canelo really was on some shit. Because if you really believe he was on some shit, which is like, look, I don't know, Clen Buterol, some really weird. I don't know, whatever. Anyway, it's a, except for like. The hardcore ones from the eighties. It's a very oh. strange, it, but it, but regardless, if you feel that Canelo was not on some shit, like he was clean, then yeah, you probably are looking at Golovkin like, dude, you're a dick. You're heckling about him, uh, heckling him about some shit that didn't even happen. Whereas, you know, if you feel that it's very suspicious, you're just like, I don't know, man. C- C- Golovkin's calling you on it. Like, what do you want me to say? He's calling your ass, bro. So it kind of depends on that, but um, you know, I guess if you believe that Canelo's clean, then yeah, you could see the bitterness from him too. Totally. Um, but all together, man, it's just a lot of unanswered questions that finally it's gonna get finished. This is the fight that the zones wanted from the very beginning when they signed both of these guys. Um, this is a fight that Eddie Hearn has wanted to have a piece of when Canelo first signed with the zone, and even though he had nothing crazy and everything going on, like this was the end game. So much money has been spent. So much money has been involved. For Man, they got they got Daniel Jacobs. They got Boo Boo. Yeah. They like I think for a bit had uh, Drevianchenko or something. Like yeah. they had this and entire. They were, and also, they were trying to fill you know get the Charlos. Anyone else they can get, they were trying to pull in there. Anybody. They had this entire middleweight fucking smorgasbord, bro. And the entire and the whole cake topper was supposed to be this third fight for like however many years now. So you know they they are pulling it off, but man, it, it was a little bit of a ride. It really, really was. It, <laughs> it's gotten to the point where if you go on boxing Twitter, more than one person I've noticed has said, "I don't really care about this Saturday. It does nothing for me." <laughs> I disagree. I think that that's a fucking that's ultra. A no, I, I totally agree with that. That's an ultra hipster fucking shit to say, in my opinion. But this isn't like watching Mike Tyson, Kevin McBride, or one of those like you know throwaway fights or something like that. Yeah, come on, like, bro. Absolutely not, man. Like I said, these are still two of the top guys. Canelo obviously is still on the pound for pound list. Triple G is still an elite fighter. Even though yeah, it's, it's not my favorite fight ever. I'm just saying oh, it's no, it's not it's nothing. A good one. And it's just going to be a finale. After this, it's over. We don't have to think about this um, unless something stupid yeah. happens and somehow and, they want to make the fourth fight. But yeah. And bro, what if what if the craziest shit happened? What if it's like you know Golovkin's just like fuck this and knocks him out in like the second round or something like that. Like, that's going to be like, yeah. everyone's going to be like, what? You know, of course, it wouldn't be as earth shattering as if uh, Canelo had defeated Bivol. But if he defeated Bivol, this probably wouldn't have been happening. Or I know it was planned, but I'm saying like, if he would have like crushed Bivol, the, the circumstances would be different here. So even either way, if Golovkin were to get this win and a win like that would be massive and it would be a huge upset of the entire landscape and on top of that he would be winning the the unified the undisputed super middleweight championship so i mean that opens up possibilities in and of itself and canelo would have to rethink some shit two losses in a row you know one bad loss but again that's obviously just conjecture uh the, on the other on the other side if canelo winds up just absolutely beating the crap out of golovkin i would imagine that's probably the end for golovkin no it has to be, it has to be. Um, he's already up there in age. He's forty years old, 
his body has been breaking down for a while now and sure it seems loses, like it yeah and if he loses emphatically in this fight where else is there for him to turn you think about it you know is he going to go back down to Medway and become uh, an underdog against one of the char against charlo or you know yeah, going down and wait at this age would be exactly or you know someone like benavides and want to pick up the scraps or something like that so if he loses this one, maybe he'll go out with like another win as like a final fight or something, but I can't see him uh, having a long career after this. But if he scores a major, a major victory, like you said, then who knows, you know, even yeah. then I can't see him still having like a long sustained career. I think like he might be um, fulfilled and, you know, satisfied enough that he might call it a day after that, regardless. That's true. So I think that uh, as far as, the likelihood of what's going to happen, dude. I, I don't, I don't think that it's going to be the blowout. Many people think it's going to be, but I do think Canelo is probably going to pull it off. Yeah. Um, and on top of that, you know, I think the best case scenario for fans, uh, for him, as far as credibility and, you know, getting fans on his side, I think the best case scenario would be for him to win for him to beat Golovkin. And then to immediately afterwards be like, all right, what's up, David Benavidez? Are we doing this or what? Totally. Or Charlo or whoever. I'm yeah, totally Charlo would be great too. But I think that... Benavidez I, and Super Middleweight, yeah, would definitely be the fight that everyone's really looking for. That's, yeah, that seems to be the fight that a lot of people would like to... That be, The fighter many people believe would be too much for Canelo or that deserves his shot or whatever, Super Middleweight. So Wait, you I think that, that would be... What's that? So you don't want to see Boo Boo? <laughs> <laughs> you fought you you fought with no body man you fought with no get get the fuck out of here yeah one of the most <laughs> overwhelming I, you know. man I, I, I don't even man, i've known i've seen boo boo since he was a kid i like, know you know and all that but i can't justify any of the stupidity over the years i, I don't even have anything against him it's not even like i know yeah, a lot of people yeah. like they really don't like him and whatever but i don't have anything against him it's just that i can't defend him either because i'm just like bro you're bro you're making a clown of yourself i'm sorry but you are it's it's yeah, sad I get it. he's a total fucking airhead but like you know yeah it's it's sad like, that you've yeah. been dude's been a pro for that long and your ledger's that thin dude it doesn't it just doesn't make sense and but, and i i know that he kind of got screwed over a little bit like but it's just yeah yeah no i'm not that interested in that at all bro. <laughs> i don't think anybody is no but I, you know it's just is it kind of like leaving no stone unturned kind of thing? Like he's got nobody else. Sure. But I'm, yeah. I'm not motivated to see it really. I don't give a fuck. I hear you. No, <laughs> no, it should be fun this weekend, dude. I think that it should be, uh, the main event should be good. The rest of the card is, I'm not going to lie to everybody. I'm not going to try to puff it up when it's not, it's not, it's nothing that I don't, that I think is very worthwhile, particularly. Uh, there's another Kazakh fighter that, of course, perennial kind of trial horse, Gabe Rosado is stepping in to fight. And so that's interesting from the perspective of Gabe Rosado kind of being a, a barometer, uh, a uh, prospect barometer once again. But at the same time, it's not a it's not a thick card, dude. I'm not going to lie to people. The main event's where it's at, and it's the Canelo show. Totally. And that goes for most pay-per-view shows. I know a lot of people are griping about this being on pay-per-view and rightfully so considering what the zone's motto was when they first came on the scene about everything just being on the app and no pay-per-views and all this other stuff and they're changing the game like all these different entities when they first come on they're saying that they're changing everything up and inevitably they go in the same route that's always been the same tried and true since the 80s and 90s which is pay-per-view so yeah, after his own bled money out for various reasons, including trying to put this third fight together, they're at the point now where they're like, oh, well, you get so-and-so fights for free and everything else, that, you know, along with the app. But if you want to get Canelo and you want Anthony Joshua and you want this or you want that one, you got to have to pony up $80 for it. Oh, and by the way, we're, you know, um, changing your yearly uh, subscription to X amount of money next year. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, it will end, and their customer service is like nil. It's like almost yeah. non-existent. Anyway, we're not. I'm not going to go on and on about about DAZN, but it has been a funky situation, and I just hope that everything goes off this weekend without a hitch, 
There's nothing crazy. It's a good fight. It's a good show. I hope for the best. You know, from a fan perspective, I want to see good. I don't want to see bad. I want to see good. Yeah, I think we're going to see good. Like we said, man, these styles are going to mesh well. They hate each other, and it's going to be a definitive, I guess, hopefully a definitive ending to their rivalry. And all that said, I'm looking forward to it. Plus, I'm working the fight. So, I mean, you know, can't say I'm not looking forward to it at all. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> totally, dude. That's It's awesome that uh, people are actually going to see the fruits of your labor on the screen. It's going to be, yeah, they're going to be talking about it. It's going to be awesome. Um, actually, that gives me just a second to mention, too. If anybody is looking for it, I actually will be over at ppv.com this weekend for the fight in their live chat with uh, Piolin, which was a... Uh, a, a radio personality who I actually used to listen to a long, long time ago, back in the day at a radio show called Piolin por la Mañana that was like the shit in San Diego. It was a hilarious show. People like, you know, they'd call people and pranks and all sorts of stuff. Anyway, uh, there's a live chat function on ppv.com when you order the fight there and you can go on there and interact with fans and stuff like that. There's should be a lot of Spanish speaking fans. So I'm, um, bilingual and all just be in there kind of like kicking it if anybody's interested that's it but yeah dude um i i do hope it's a good fight this weekend i'm looking forward to it and i appreciate you once again hopping on here with me man and hell yeah hell yeah man um should be a good show everybody like pat said not the best overall card but the main event should make up for it plus bam rodriguez is always good action, and he's a future pound for pound entry, in my opinion. That's true. I don't want to gloss over yeah. him. The fight's not high quality, in my opinion. But I it, think he, I think after what he's been doing lately, man, I think he's worth a gimme. Oh yeah, yeah. Don't get me wrong. He's worth checking out, even just in a feature. But yeah, because yeah. it's one of those fights too that, like, you know, when those young champions would get featured on a pay per view undercard, like remember back in the day, Fernando Vargas did. Yeah, that's true. Uh, brothers would you know it would happen? They would be against like nondescript opposition, like an easy you know layup title defense, but they would still see some action. Speaking of that fight, that was actually really funny because that was the Lennox Lewis Holyfield one, the first fight. And since Don King was promoting it and Vargas was with main events, Vargas undefeated, you know, a budding superstar, and King put him as a curtain opener. <laughs> <laughs> of course yeah because he didn't he didn't have him under contract he didn't have so anything like, under contract so he put him as a curtain opener you remember if like hbo still aired it on pay-per-view but there was only like two people in the audience that's ridiculous dude but you know king would do that on a lot of those i, thought, I mean it's actually, like you, you don't really you know you don't really think about it back then but that's absolutely hysterical that would definitely get talked about a lot on twitter today well, even when he was a high, when he was even a high level contender, dude, there's a number of those Julian Jackson fights that are in like the outdoor arena and there's like yeah. 15 people in the audience and shit like that. And it was like, damn, Jesus. That would be like taking, I don't know, who's one of the Charlo brothers or Benavides or something like that. And since King didn't have any options or anything on him, sticking him at the very first fight where there's only the ushers in there and some security guards and, you know, up. medical personnel <laughs> with the judges, that's it. <laughs> well, thankfully, at least DAZN's not doing that. So no, it's, no. it's a low bar, but they're, they're, cro- they're, they're clearing it. Thank goodness. So, Yeah, dude. Well, hey, dude, I, again, I appreciate it. Uh, it should be a good show. Everybody who listened in, we appreciate you. Thank you so much. Uh, if you did listen in via those podcast apps, subscribe. Please give us a rating, leave a reply, etc. And if you watched on YouTube, thank you. Go ahead, subscribe there as well, and also leave a reply or comment. We do appreciate those. I try to respond to them if I see them. And also, as far as social media goes, we're on social media, but the Knuckles and Gloves podcast is on Facebook and Instagram, also on Twitter. Eris is on Twitter himself as Punch Zone Eris. I'm on there as Patrick M. Connor. Hopefully, we'll talk to you there. Eris, thanks Hello. again, bro. We'll talk to you soon. Have a good one, everyone. 